The work of art and the work of culture pave the way for a qualitative practice of the imagination, a practice without which we have no name, or we will have no name, no face, and no voice in history. So our session is going to explore how crea creativity, or what are loosely called creative culture, um, and how it's an integral part in our quest to essentially define ourselves, our, our communities, and our society. And of course, this rule, as you know, applies across the globe at varying degrees, no doubt. Um, but the point is, it enriches society, and it enriches humanity. So let's just start off with this, this definition that perhaps we might need to have, because it's quite a broad spectrum mm -hmm. um, of creative culture. I'll, I'll, let's start with you, right in the middle, Zahira. <laughs> let's go. What, does, what defines creative culture for you? Um, well, I, you know, I have a, a professional feel about that and yeah. a personal one. Yes. My personal one is very artistic, and I enjoy the breaking down of uh, society and for us when viewing or experiencing this in, in music and performance and dance, theatre, for us to reconstruct it while we're experiencing this mm. and then to debate and talk about that. But professionally, I have a very uh, designed way of thinking and so my organization is called Designing South Africa and I founded Designing Brazil as well, which focuses um, on the intersection of that creative, contemporary creative culture um, with uh, technical ability uh, as well as identity and individual expression and what is a social need. So for me, yeah. Designing South Africa is very much about that social need and that societal need that, um, that also considers our environment. And so I, you know, I have a bit of a mixed bag family. Uh, my dad is uh, of Indian descent. My mum is Iranian Burmese. Mm -hmm. uh, and I grew Exotic up in- Exotic you are. <laughs> I grew up in <laughs> KwaZulu-Natal on the East Coast. And my dad and I would go to the beach every Sunday um, to get octopus for, for bait. He loved to fish. And um, on this one occasion, I remember so clearly, we were asked to like foot sack off the beach, like to get out, because yeah. we didn't belong there, and surely my dad should have known that. And so that's etched in his mind uh, yeah. forever, you know, and, and, and for me to remember that. And I asked my dad, I said, well, why did we get kicked off the beach? And he, uh, he and we had, were asked, ushered somewhere else. And he said, well, because we're Indians are here, and we're not allowed to be here, and I should have known. And so I said, but dad, I, you're, this is the Indian Ocean. It was in Kwasi <laughs> right? You own the beach, you were meant to be here, you deal with the rules. And, and also often, because my mom was classified white in those days because of this Persian uh, background and heritage of hers. And so um, she would get us ice cream while we would sit in the car and watch people be on the beach and have an amazing time. I'd be in my bikini waiting to have a good time, but not really accessing it. Accessing. And so um, <clears throat> I used to, a wonder. And so my dad said, no, we are darker than these people. This is Central Beach in Plettenberg Bay. And so I said, but dad, everyone's trying to be dark. We're already dark. We're ahead of the game. I always thought we were ahead of the game. We're ahead of the game. I love that. <laughs> but in apartheid South Africa, we were not. And so what I thought, like to this day, if I say to my dad, hey, let's go somewhere. And he says, Zahira, it's not for us. And so already, this designed, these architects, what, what they used to say during apartheid, the architects of apartheid. So what that already said to me as a young child was that our spaces in South Africa were designed to separate people. Yes. So nothing was really public. I mean, two black people standing together could be um, a strike action. A revolution. Or yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So all of that was controlled. Um, and so what I had to, when I started designing South Africa, I started to dissect this a lot. Uh, so if these spaces were designed to separate, what are designers doing to put people together? Mm. So mm. you don't just get a public space. Events, I think this is why the World Cup works so well, events brought those people, everyone, not just South Africans, but uh, people from all over the world brought us together. So already that was a designed scenario. Yes. So, and in these spaces we're telling stories um, that... Um, and have never been told before. Mm -hmm. Like just developing Designing South Africa has been a very cathartic experience for me. Because yeah. I started to revisit these childhood experiences that we were forced to be very shameful uh, or ashamed of. Yes. So we wouldn't talk, uh, talk about. So for me, this really important aspect of creative culture is what, how does that plug in? So when you have this amazing idea, how does that plug in to a designed experience in society? Mm -hmm. And I, I want to move it further from fancy things for fancy people into how does design 
uh, make life better for all. Yes. You know, our ANC, our government slogan is a better life for all. Yeah. But how do we design that experience? Yes. And so we have, uh, we've just launched our two-year program uh, called Designing Democracy, mm -hmm. uh, leading up to our 20-year celebration next year. And I remember being in the queues. Um, my uncle was in exile for 37 years. I remember the moment when he walked into the room. And so these are the things that I want to, um, I want to consider in, uh, in this development. So um, the key areas are designing an identity. What is a South African identity? Yeah. And how do other people experience and are welcome? Because I remember when I started working, in, I started my career, it was always, a, always an us and them. They must be South African enterprise, but that international collaboration is key mm. from different parts of yeah. Africa uh, and internationally, absolutely. And then designing cities. You know, 64% of South Africa's population live in cities. How are we designing that experience? I spoke to Mayor Park Stow, and I said, people live in ships in your city. <laughs> in ships, eight hours. Yeah, yeah. So how are we, uh, that's a disservice. Please put that on, I need you to be heard. <laughs> and so uh, this, uh, I'm not quite sure how to do it. Uh, so this is a, a disservice uh, yeah. to uh, an Afri this huge African uh, population that are using Johannesburg as this arrival city. They're arriving. Yeah. But are we designing the experience? Are they coming into Central Park Station and seeing pep stores? Are they seeing African tapestry of arrival, of saying, wow. you have come into this gold rush city. You have come to make your gold, and we are welcoming and you. Yeah. And but next year question. we're going to have one. Sorry, no, oh, that question of identity. I just wanted to spread it out. <laughs> okay, okay. I wanted to hear because it was. It's a very big point when it comes to creative culture and how you, how you um, experience that, how you experience your heritage. Um, it, it draws from this identity. Yeah. Zizi, could you throw some light on that and how it works for you? In, in your field, because African fashion is this big thing now. Everyone's, you know, you yeah. see it in Vogue, you see it in Vanity mm -hmm. Fair, you're seeing it in global press. Has that influenced the way you approach your work? Has it, uh, I don't know, has it changed in any way? Well, I know when I started um, with the globalization, it was um, out of the need um, to kind of find out an identity for myself. Yeah. Um, coming from Nigeria, uh, Ten years ago, it was difficult to find anybody wearing anything that is African. We, we tend to like, um, you see everybody in suits and evening wears and things like that. And I remember when I, when I, I, I started, I was like, you know what, I, you, could, you could tell somebody from um, the Maasai or, you know, I, I see pictures of the Zulu outfits and the way they dress with the whole thing and I'm like, wow. This is Africa. This, they know themselves. They know who they are. And I'm thinking, I don't know where I'm from in terms of um, my culture, my heritage, and things like that. And when I started this um, thing with the African print, it was so difficult to try to push it through because a lot of people thought I was mad. A lot of people thought, you know, you, it's just not going to work. It's, this is... African print, it's just not going to be better. The, the outside world is not going yeah, the, the, the outside world is not going to buy it or anything like mm. that. And people, um, when I first tied up my hair, because I thought as an African woman, you know, this is the, it's just our crown and glory. Yes. You know, when you're dressed up, you look regal, you stand up, and you, you, you just create this presence. And at one time, they said, oh, you know, she doesn't have money to make her hair. And that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you see, that's, it's so strange yeah. that you say that because I'm from Kenya. We look across at West Africa and we think those guys have got it sorted in terms of a mm. national dress or the way to... It, it's really interesting no, it to took, hear it you took, saying It took that. a long while. It took a long yeah. while. There was a competition I went once and um, um, it was for the uh, designer of the year. And we had like different categories and you're supposed to come up with a, um, um, a beach wear, a, uh, a cup braid an evening, a, a bridal, and so forth. And I came up with this thing that I had leaves, you know, just to cover there and then, whatever. And at the end of the thing, anyway, I won, and we did the press rounds, and one editor just decided to chew me up by asking me and telling me that I'm degrading and debasing the dignity of the African woman by doing mm. things that are one sleeve and this and showing off bits and pieces. And I was like, well, I'm sorry, but you're sitting here telling me about 
degraded and debasing the dignity of the African woman. If you look into our kings and, um, and things, the way the, the, the queens, the dress, and we have things like the Obas, the Oloris, and the Azes, and things like that. And you find that the only thing they have is just a piece of cloth around their chest, and they've got the beads on. And um, that's how the, 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 the queens and whatever dress up. And anyway, I did proceed to, let, uh, to, to make him understand that we as Africans, we have our own heritage, we have our own cultures. Whatever we're having now, it, it's something sold to us by the Western world. Mm -hmm. And we're only just interpreting and taking from that. But then the thing is, it's making us lose who we really yeah. are, you know, as Africans. Interpretation, I like that. Because we see it a lot in music. Yes. Mm. Um, some of us gripe, I certainly do, <laughs> about how music tends to be everyone looking out and then trying to adapt what's happening out there to create something that could be termed African, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, you do a lot of um, poetry, hip hop, um, spoken word, and that, that draws from the oral traditions, which are you know, very strong, that's rooted in our continent. How does it work for you in your chosen form of expression? Does, do you, are you influenced by that? And I how am. Does I it think the fundamental thing up? that um, influences me about oral tradition, whether through music or poetry, mm. is, is about telling people stories. Yeah. And, and what, what telling stories does is access the human spirit, which is fundamentally why I do what I do. Um, there are all sorts of things that drive transformation. Uh, design, po politics, etc. But I think what fundamentally inspires action is to touch the spirit. Yeah. And I think it's through creative form and art, in whichever way, and for, um, we are, we're, able to, we're able to access a point that isn't, is, that, isn't, that isn't tangible. And I think what storytelling does, the oral traditions, and, and which speaks directly to our African culture, um, is what, what informs and why I chose the, the medium that I chose. I mm -hmm. mean, fundamentally, so to, I want to inspire people's action through, through, through accessing the spirit. Yes. And spirit is, is accessed through experience. Uh, and so when you begin to reflect people's experiences, um, particularly within the context of African identity, um, which is very diverse, and, yes, and is. my personal experience has been a very diverse one. So what I've done is drawn on my personal experience as an African and shared those and allowed other people who are listening to access their own selves and their own experiences through my sharing. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. You know, this diversity um, that exists, <sighs> you see, it, it, it's somehow, when we were talking about this yesterday, I don't know if you all remember this, about the brand Africa. Tebe was up here and he was telling us all the things that we need to do, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they've taken part of that, or someone's taken part of that, this, this generalized African identity, and is pushing it out there. And there's somehow there's an equity to this as well. There's a cachet, hey, you know, this was made in Africa, look at it, it's cool, whether it's fashion, whether it's whatever. Who informs that equity? Is it something that people are a perception from outside looking in, going, hmm, yes, you guys are on, the, on a pulse, or we could make some money out of this? Is it born out of us actually saying, do you know what, this is how we're going to sell ourselves? Mm. How are we going to change that? In terms of, of the creatives, how are we going to change the way that's perceived or how it's worked? If you, are you with me on that, that question? Who informs that brand equity? Zahira, what, do you, what are your thoughts? Are you with me on that? Uh, I, I sort of understand. Feel what you're saying, yeah. yeah. I, I sort of understand, and I think... You know, that question, <laughs> just jumped out of your... Then, then I think no, go ahead. should go ahead. We have a choice in, in terms of, of awesome. informing whatever brand equity we want to. We are, we're, in the, we're in the process of creating um, this African identity that people are... Are, are tapping into. Yeah. So, so when you when you say who in, who informs the brand equity, what's it worth? What does it mean? What is it to you and your work? For me, I can create. For me, it's about creating the value. It's about creating the identity. It's about it's about taking ownership. I you know this 
this equity that people are all buying into, it's almost, yeah. it's almost becoming like a, a fad of, of it's sorts. It's a fad, it feels a, a, like a fad. The world is in this um, African identity fad. And, I, we, and I, one, I think the, the, the attention is, is a really valuable thing. But yeah. now we need to leverage the platform and, and define what, 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 that that, is. what that is. What it could be. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, it begins with knowing yourself. We always talk about, even on a spiritual sense, that it, it, it starts with you. And when you know who you are, you know which direction you can take things or how we can move the continent forward. Um, this whole thing, that I, there's, a, there's a, a thread that I've seen working through all your work. Mm -hmm. There's a certain holistic, you've spoken about the spiritual or the spirit. Um, how do we create more organic, holistic connections? How do we evolve those in terms of the creative sphere? Naima. Oh, sorry, Zahira. <laughs> How do we create the... Um, yeah. I don't understand the question. You see, you've, you've spoken about, for example, spaces being of wellness and respect. Right, yes. That is a holistic, more organic way of doing sure. things, isn't it? Well, no, I... Yeah, well, I also... Yes, holistic, or absolutely. Approaching. But I, I definitely think it's very tangible. Mm. It's, these spaces that you walk into or experience and buildings, they're all very tangible. Yeah. I think sometimes... I think it's also so, sometimes a kind of... Uh, cop out when people go, oh, that's the soft stuff you work with, you know, and that's that's not what women do usually. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 and so I say, well, none of this is soft. Um, I'm just gonna, well, this is the, the book I published book last year, and I'm just gonna make some reference to some images uh, that David Goldblatt was very kind to, to give us for the book. And the book is in English and Brazilian Portuguese, uh, and it focuses on design spaces for the World Cup mainly because, well, they're hosting the World Cup next year. Uh, and so we wanted to share our experiences with them. And so um, there's some amazing images that he's given us. And this photograph is unfinished houses taken in 2000, uh, sorry, 1999, part of the RDP uh, housing program. Mm -hmm. And so here, I mean, this is a very tangible experience. This is the pro part of the promise of the one million houses yeah. for, for one million people or more. And um, what you're not seeing there is firstly a road, you're not seeing a park no. or a community center, maybe a healthcare uh, facility, the wellness uh, and respect. a school. So yeah. all of this is like when you build a house, you build a community. You don't just build a, a structure. So that's the designing element that we talk about. Mm. And so holistic is when you say, okay, I do public works, I work in public works, but are you also talking to education? Are you also talking to, we talked about uh, rape and safety and security. These are collaborative, but they're also designed experiences. Yes. They, you don't just put up a building. And so these are a result of um, cookie cutter solutions uh, and not design solutions made by uh, architects that are of any uh, good standing. Mm -hmm. And so I work with really good architects in South Africa that are not getting the work uh, of, of amazing spaces because our, our government unfortunately is hiring the cookie cutter type property developers that will give them the lowest cost but not give them a community. And so this was a temporary solution. This is Dipslut, also photographed by David Goldblatt. In 1994 was a temporary solution. This photograph was taken by David Goldblatt 2009. So already a community has been created. So how, do, how does design fit into here with graphic design? I went to the Morningside Virgin Active Gym, mm -hmm. and this is the big, the big difference. You know, from my childhood, seeing slacks, blankets, whites only. You know, so basically, this place isn't for you. I walked into the Morningside Virgin Active Gym, and it said, everyone's welcome, unfit and fit, old and young. And, and I just thought, where are those signs around public spaces in South Africa, saying this place is for you. In 2001, I was asked to, to leave a beach with a Chinese friend of mine. And so- 2001. 2001, okay. we were like, why? He says, no, but you don't belong here. Because uh, 10 years before that, we weren't allowed to be there. And so somebody didn't tell them along the line that uh, things have has broken down. <laughs> because those morning side type of signs were not around. Uh -huh. If they had signs saying, welcome to all, I bet you that group of people wouldn't have asked us to leave because they would know that their attitude needed to change. Uh -huh. So these are very designed solutions, but they're very tangible as well. Okay. So they go from housing, education, to community development. And so um, these are the holistic. You start with one <coughs> thing and go into a holistic uh, solution. Yeah, but that you're talking about building houses, and this is the point. A lot of people tend to think of creatives as people who are kind of 
heads in the clouds yes. and you know it's all very cool but it's actually a tool for development mm, yes. you know and people don't seem to realize that it's an economic driver it enriches society Zizi, your designs have made you a household name in nigeria you've been practicing you know fashion designer for over t 10 years i want to also know what the government what government structures there are mm. Um, in fact, from all three of you, um, that support the arts. Because this is something, again, like, like I said earlier, people tend to see it like quite flighty, actually, and something that women do. Well, I, I am, in Nigeria right now, I think um, various art forms are really making waves. Um, the arts have... Music, uh, for example. Music, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the film industry as well. And it's amazing to see how much the youth, in terms of art, have turned around the negative image that Nigeria used to have. And um, they've done so much in, in pushing Nigeria into the diaspora and then you know, making people know that Nigeria is full of talent and full of um, uh, Figure uh, and exactly, energy. So and many things. Yes. You know, um, if you go to New York now, most of the um, designers for the New York Fashion Week is Nigerians and the the, the the film festivals as well, you find Nollywood actresses and things like that, and also most of our, our young artists and things. And they're doing a lot of collaborations with international artists as well mm -hmm. and things. And um, yeah, at, at first, like you said, the, it used to be something that when you say arts and artists, and they all seem, they all tend to be dropouts and, yes. you, you know, non-serious know people. Life. But <laughs> <laughs> really, when you look at it, um, like they say, love is, a, is what makes the world go around. Art really is what doesn't, it brings, it unites people, and it doesn't have any boundary whatsoever. And so... Um, the government has now seen that there is quite a lot to be uh, gained by being part of what is going on. Mm -hmm. And um, the, 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 there are now various structures that have been set up to help and promote different art, artists and art forms. Um, they have the Agoa thing going on for a while now that um, designers and things are able to export their products out yeah. to places like America and things. And then right now, the, there is this thing going, um, they call the U-Win, which is set up, um, it's, it's a kind of grant, and then um, um, various people come in, you go through um, some tests and everything, and then when you're through with it, <clears throat> you, you're giving a grant up, up to... Uh, uh, how much is 10 million naira now in rands? I have I don't know the conversion, but at least let's say Somebody about six, seven thousand. Ten million naira. Six, seven thousand dollars. You know, something like that. And um, still, when you're giving that grant, you, it's been monitored. You know, to see that you're 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 helping other people. Yes. Along the line as well. And I would say also the British Council in Nigeria is doing very well in terms of promoting arts and uh, and culture. And right now, even they have teamed up with um, um, MTN Nigeria, and they're having. I'm doing these promotions for free. You, you oh seem to be. You <laughs> see, you see the, the interesting thing there. You, you mentioned British Council, and a lot of this tends to be donor funded yeah. when yes, it comes to yes, the art. Yes. When are we going to get our governments to actually do something about it? That, that, that's the question. What do yeah. you, what do you see, uh, Naima? <sighs> But, you know, my personal, and I'm very passionate about this issue because, yes, you're, you're, the stereotypes around being involved mm. in the creative industries, oh, wonderful, at least you're doing something you love. <laughs> um, and, quite, and quite frankly, that doesn't acknowledge the fact that the creative industry, just like any under, other industry, is, is a business. And what we don't do is harness the, the entrepreneurial skills of creative people enough, mm -hmm. I find. You mm -hmm. know? So you'll get a lot of uh, donor funding, et cetera, to, to build your creative capacity, which is wonderful and is required to, to achieve a level of excellence. But if you don't have the skills to transform that into some sort of commercial business, um, one, as Africans, we'll never really take it seriously as yeah. an economically viable uh, career path. Um, but the potential for what we can create, and I think Nigeria is a great um, example of beginning to grow an industry to a point where people 
see it as, and yeah. respect it mm. as um, not just from a creative perspective, from an economic one, because, mm. and we'll always be on the back end um, of the US and the UKs, et cetera, from an industry perspective, until us as Africans begin to shift our mindsets around what we can create with our, create, uh, with our creative and cultural. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. So from a government perspective, I would like to see um, more initiatives around building creative entrepreneurs. Yes. I mean, it's happening. And I mean, with, particularly with the young, with the young uh, society and youth culture, um, we are missing out on something, I think, um, in speaking specifically to South Africa, but we are slowly beginning to, because young people are forcing their creative agendas more so now, and because they see what's happening, and because of globalization and access to culture all over the world, they see the potential of turning a creative idea into an economic one mm. and into a business structure mm. that, that can facilitate the growth of, the, of an entire industry. Yeah. Mm. Um, we have pockets of it happening, but given the numbers of young oh, people yeah. and the... I think we, we could still push that agenda yeah, a lot yeah. further. I, I was just thinking as you were speaking about, it, in terms of music, traditional instruments and how there's, there's, we have such a wealth of them on the African continent and yet you hardly hear anything. It's everyone's being, I would love to hear contemporary artists, whether they're doing hip hop, using an African traditional instrument mm. to bring that in and give it a distinct sound because that is, that's what makes our culture distinct. Um, and yet it seems like we're just selling out to something else. Um, do you see that or what do you feel? I know you've chosen something particular, a specific. I've, look, I, I, I definitely see it happening. Um, the commercial world does tend to, to, to have a dominate, uh, dominating um, uh, perception, but I, I just, the fusions are happening, you know, because we are becoming increasingly uh, exposed to diverse... Conscious. Cultures. We are. I, I think through the the Kwaitos and I'm, I'm not sure what the the sound is called. This ni the Nigerian pop uh. sound. Um, <laughs> Zizi goes. Zizi's thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I I see I see young people, young Africans taking ownership of a, a very, a very distinct sound, mm. um, which is African. <coughs> Um, could we could we incorporate the indigenous sounds a bit more? Yes, but I think that will happen that will with collaborations from, and this comes to cross generational influences mm, and mentorship mm, from a mm. creative point of view and from a business point of view. I think young people are better on the younger people are better on the entrepreneurial side from a from a from a creative industry perspective because yeah. we're we're now releasing music independently, etc. But from a from a from a sound perspective, I think we could learn a lot. From, from previous generations, so we need to be able to find spaces to, to create those to create levels those of things. collaboration. 